Hey guys, this is with Nursing School Made Easy. Today's lecture is going to focus on pleural effusion. So let's get right into it. Again, this focus is on pleural effusion. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the main purpose of our lungs? So if you answer correctly, you'd say gas exchange. Okay. So here's a drawing of my thoracic cavity. We have right side and here we have left side. Now inside your thoracic cavity, inside your chest, you're going to have your lungs. And this is where gas exchange will occur. Now, and this would be your lung tissue. But also remember that there is a space between your lung and your chest wall. So it's a pleural space. Now also remember that in here you have a little bit of fluid and the purpose of this fluid is to help lubricate your lung and your thoracic cavity so or your chest wall so that any time that you take a deep breath in when this portion hits this wall there's lubrication there's easy movement again just to facilitate breathing so that is the purpose of this fluid this is about 5 cc's to maybe 15 cc's of fluid so it's not a lot again that purpose is just to lubricate help everything move a lot easier a lot faster well in pleural effusion we have an accumulation or an increased amount of fluid in this space so again just to mention it again pleural effusion simply means an increased in fluid accumulation or an abnormal amount of fluid in the pleural space now if this accumulation begins to increase drastically this fluid in here will begin to compress or cause pressure on the lung. As a result, the lung will not be able to expand like it should, and it will decrease the amount of oxygen exchange that occurs. And for that reason, patients will complain of dyspnea or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Okay? So again, the amount of dyspnea or shortness of breath will depend on how much fluid accumulation occurs. If there is a large amount of fluid, again, there's less room for that lung to expand and again, making it more difficult for the patient to breathe. Okay, so this would be, again, fluid accumulation, not allowing that lung to expand. <clears throat> So what are some causes for pleural effusion? Number one, something like heart failure. Again, your heart, in heart failure, your heart will not be able to pump adequately. As a result, fluid will begin to accumulate in your lower extremities and your upper extremities, and also in your lungs, in your thoracic cavity, in your chest. So that would be one cause. Second cause may be something like liver disease, renal failure, something like cirrhosis. And in that scenario, you would have something like hypoalbuminemia. So know that for the NCLEX again, hypoalbuminemia. That would allow for an increase in fluid accumulation in the lungs. Number three, some type of bleeding into that space. Maybe the patient was involved in an MVA, had some type of rib fracture, that would again cause bleeding to occur and that blood would accumulate in the pleural space, again making it difficult for that patient to breathe due to this pressure lung. Number four, <clears throat> You must know that the fluid, let's say that there's about five to 15 cc's of fluid in here. Okay, this is, this, this is a normal patient. Well, in a normal patient, your lymphatic system removes this fluid. 
Okay, so if there's any problem with your lymphatic system, that will again result in fluid accumulation. So decreased lymphatic clearance. That would also increase the amount of fluid in the pleural space. Number five, some type of infection. Now this could be like pneumonia, tuberculosis, some type of lung abscess. Again, that would increase the amount of fluid accumulation in that space. Now, anytime that you have an infection, you always worry about something called an empyema. And an empyema is just purulent fluid in the pleural space. So what are some clinical manifestations that you have to be aware of? Number one, <clears throat> dyspnea, shortness of breath. This is the most important thing that you need to know. Because again, it depends on how much fluid is present. It depends on what the cause is. With something like heart failure, the dyspnea may progress gradually. If it's something like a pneumonia, you may have a sick kid was okay one day, the next day he's having severe difficulty breathing. So again, if you are dyspnea, you have low O2 saturation levels, it can cause altered mental status. And you always wanna make sure that, especially if it's a pediatric patient, that you apply O2 therapy immediately. Okay, so make sure you know that dyspnea can occur. So that is the number one thing. Number two, decreased movement of the chest wall. And this again has to do with this increase in pressure due to this fluid being present. Decreased or absent lung sounds. Number four, if you were to percuss, you would know that there would be dullness to percussion. There'd be fever present, especially if it's some type of infection that is occurring, a pneumonia, a TB, some type of abscess, you would have a fever. Along with this fever, some type of cough night sweats, especially if it's something like tuberculosis. Weight loss. Now what are some interventions that you, that you as a nurse would perform? First thing is you would assess, okay? You wanna make sure that you know what those O2 uh, saturation levels are. It'd be very, very different if you have a patient who's setting at 77% versus a patient that is setting at 90%. Okay, so before you do anything, you must assess. After you assess, you may need to apply some O2 therapy, either nasal cannula or mask. Now, for example, let's say that the patient has heart failure. In this scenario, you would give something like a diuretic. You would decrease sodium intake. If it is somebody with heart failure, if the emphysema, excuse me, not emphysema, if the effusion, excuse me, if the effusion is severe enough, Again, you want to make sure that that patient is in an upright position or semi-upright position. 
you do not want to place this patient in a supine position because that's only going to increase the amount of pressure on the chest. It's going to make it difficult for that patient to breathe. So again, you would sit them semi-upright or upright. You would administer antibiotic therapy. And this is to treat the infection. If it is severe enough, the effusion is severe enough, something like a chest tube insertion may be performed. And this will be very, very likely if there is an empyema present. Or, for example, something like a thoracentesis may be performed. Now, what exactly is a thoracentesis? We talked about how it's just removal of fluid from the lung. So I got a couple of tools here that maybe, hopefully it'll help this cement a little bit more into your brain. Now in a thoracentesis, you'll have your patient sitting at the side of the bed, leaning forward. You know, this would make it easier for the physician to come in and um, insert a large needle into the chest, something like so. Again, that needle would most likely be larger, making it easier for the physician to draw fluid from the lung space. Okay, so something like this, again, the physician would do this. Let's pretend that my glove here is the lung. So again, your patient would be sitting at the edge of the bed, leaning forward, a chest x-ray would be obtained, or a CT chest may also be obtained, to know exactly where the effusion is. You have to know where it is before you can do anything. You have to know how big it is, because that will determine how much fluid can be removed. If it's a small effusion, most likely um, antibiotic therapy will help resolve the issue. You'll tell your patient to ambulate, cough and deep breathe. If the effusion is, however, very, very large, causing severe dyspnea, decrease in O2 sats, or well, something like a thoracentesis may be performed, again, to remove that fluid. So always, you, the physician must know, and they obviously know, but if you're cleaning the area, you must use sterile technique, okay? Because again, you do not want to introduce any other type of bacteria into the lung. That would only make things worse. So again, after cleansing the area appropriately, the physician would most likely just come here, and insert the needle quickly and begin to draw the fluid out. Once the fluid is removed, that would get rid of some of the pressure on the lung, making it much easier for that patient to breathe. Now, once the physician removes the needle, you would then place a dressing onto that area. Now notice how my glove here still maintains its shape. Okay, it's not leaking anything. It didn't burst. So that is what we hope for occurs during this thoracentesis or even during a chest uh, drain insertion. We do not want further collapsing of the lung to occur. But, however, you must be aware that maybe or that it is very likely that the patient may end up with a pneumothorax. For that reason, you always want to assess your patient. Again, you want to watch out for a pneumo post thoracentesis or post chest tube insertion. Okay, is your patient having difficulty breathing? Are they displaying signs of air hunger? What are their O2 sats? Okay, so before you leave your patient's room, after the procedure is performed, make sure you assess your patient extremely well. Take your time with them, because again, you do not want to leave the room only to find out that they can't breathe. Okay, 
So please guys, always, always assess your patient.